Anthony Bourdain, the professional chef, the fearless food adventurer, the prolific drinker of alcohol in all her glorious forms, the talented writer, the iconic world traveler, the straight-talking New Yorker, the loving father, and ultimately, the brilliant but deeply flawed man with a heart the size of his lust for new cuisine, but also a heart burdened with the weight of his own intelligence and a dark and pragmatic understanding of the world. That was my attempt to capture some of the spirit and voice of someone who's meant the world to myself and so many others. It's a pale imitation of the icon, but can anyone truly re-embody the voice of someone so unique and captivating as Anthony Bourdain? It would be foolish of anyone to think so. Anthony Bourdain passed away on June 8th, 2018. This video is not going to discuss his death, nor try to speculate on his mindset leading up to that tragic event. What I want to discuss, instead, is why I think Anthony Bourdain's legacy is so powerful, and the impact he made on the world. But I guess that's more of a cover to allow me to discuss what Anthony Bourdain means to me. So today, let's talk about the great Anthony Bourdain. Recently, I fell back into a bit of a Bourdain rabbit hole. It happens every few months. He'll pop up on my YouTube homepage and I'll decide to watch an episode or two, only to find a weekend slipped away experiencing not only the cuisines from around the world, but their cultures. To be fair, Tony has technically had around four different series, but to me, they are all fundamentally the same both in spirit and technique that one could just consider them a singular entity held together by this bigger than life rock star who kept us all glued to the screen. What made his show so treasured compared to similar travel and cuisine based entertainment? In some ways, Anthony Bourdain's shows could be considered bland in comparison to other cuisine tourism shows. His show didn't really have a hook like some others. He didn't go out of his way to eat what Western audiences would consider strange or outrageous things, although he would if the opportunity presented itself. He wasn't out there for the purpose of having weird adventures, although sometimes he would if the opportunity presented itself. He wasn't a guy who has never left his hometown and is being thrown into the thick of it. Tony was an experienced traveler, and even when thrown into new situations, he was street smart, savvy, and charming enough to be able to feel his way through it with a suave coolness which rarely let him down. Tony did all of the things other travel shows overindulge in, but they were never in and of themselves the focus. I think I speak for many when I say, we didn't watch shows like No Reservations merely to see images of pretty locales and gawk at foreign lands and their crazy customs. Rather, we were drawn into and transfixed by the pure magnetism of this bigger-than-life poet-philosopher foodie who tried to show us that countries are far greater than their popular landmarks. He wanted to shatter the highly sanitized facade of foreign lands insidiously crafted by the tourism cabals to create more palatable images and preconceptions for the purpose of siphoning money from the cargo shorts wearing rubes who travel thousands of miles only to eat at Le McDonald's. His goal was to show us that behind the iconic photo spots used to gather meaningless points on social media like Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, subscribe now, there were real people living real lives. There is a reality beyond what we usually see, and it can be dirty, harsh, uncomfortable, and sometimes tragic. But there's also beauty, love, and always lots and lots of delicious foods to discover. As Tony stated in his seminal memoir, Kitchen Confidential, do we really want to travel in hermetically sealed popemobiles through the rural provinces of France, Mexico, and the Far East, eating only in hard rock cafes and McDonald's? Or do we want to eat without fear, tearing into the local stew, the humble taqueria's mystery meat, the sincerely offered gift of a lightly grilled fish head? I know what I want. I want it all. I want to try everything once. Did he always succeed in his noble pursuit to broaden our culinary horizons? No. Sometimes Tony necessarily had to eat at a fancy hotel restaurant and enjoy it, despite his protestations against such fare. Sometimes he had to do something extremely touristy just because that is the nature of a travel show. And while his shows could be relatively formulaic, 
he strove to get beyond the superficiality to which most travel shows limit themselves. He eschewed the notion of a gimmick to draw in audiences for cheap ratings increases, and Tony, ever the rebel rock star, would likely call such marketing strategy the work of corporate prostitutes who along with their milk toast hosts are willing to bend over for a quick buck. Oh yes, viewer, may I have another? And as they sleep in their beds of money, they'll know the existential dread emanating from their heart, that they are sellouts, frauds, but not Tony. While he didn't have a cheap ploy, he had a philosophy which served as the connective through line and heart around which all his shows were based, and provided a truly sturdy foundation which made his shows timeless. To me, that heart and philosophy of the show was Tony's fundamental decency and humanism, which was grounded by a curiosity to learn and explore the depths of cuisine and culture. He wanted you to walk out of your hotel and follow the crowd to a hole-in-the-wall restaurant with low tables and plastic stools, and then chow down on that one item this cook has been perfecting for decades. When you approach your culinary education this way, to paraphrase something from Rick and Morty, you may experience a lot of food you didn't like, but you discover a lot more that you did. By sheltering ourselves away at home, when not combating a pandemic, or perhaps worse, giving ourselves the false image of superiority and worldly sophistication despite only having engaged other nations, cultures, and people at the most superficial level. <laughs> what civilized people are, and, and he prefers Monsieur Candy to Mr. Candy. Si c'est cela qu'il préfère. He doesn't speak French. Don't speak French to him. It'll embarrass him. We deprive ourselves from understanding and therefore empathizing with our brothers and sisters from around the world. I mean, just how much perspective on the life, struggles, and cuisine of Jamaica and her people can you get sequestered away at the immaculately kept Sandals Resort, where I'm sure a steady stream of food and alcoholic drink can be ferried to you by drone as you float listlessly in the pool. Now don't get me wrong, that entire scenario sounds awesome, but when we exclusively limit ourselves to that experience, we lose something. We don't see the places we visit as real, and therefore, the people who live, love, and die there as people. There's always this barrier which can result in us arrogantly proclaiming how knowledgeable and traveled we are in a region without really having more than cosmetic knowledge. It can lead us to objectify foreign people and treat entire populations as simple monoliths. In the most extreme cases, we fetishize or demonize entire peoples because we don't really recognize them as people with hopes and dreams of their own. Oh, the Japanese are so polite. Or, oh, the food in Arabic countries must be terrible. These things are born innocently enough. No traveler can experience everything, and no travel show can show us everything. So certain elements have to take priority. Look, if it's your first time in Japan and you only have a weekend to explore, I'm not gonna bust your chops for hitting all the places in your travel guide. Go get pictures of the Shibuya Scramble Crosswalk, or visit a maid cafe. You do you. But Tony tried to make sure that with his little bit of airtime, he would show the universal human experience of enjoying good food with good ingredients and hospitality. That authentic cuisine was just as much a part of understanding the history and depth of a culture. What spices are they using? Are those spices native to the region? If not, where did they come from? Does this recipe resemble something Turkish? Is that a hint of curry powder? How and why did that happen? How ubiquitous and integrated into the native cuisine are the imported ingredients? But more than the educational aspect, the real food is likely to be something truly special. Of course, Tony had fixers who could set up a variety of culinary experiences, including those mouth-watering but labor-intensive home-cooked meals which most of us can't really experience in our usual travels. But really, all he wanted for us to do was to get outside our comfort zone, be willing to see what a country truly had to offer, and from that experience, build a bond and curiosity to learn more. A staunch advocate of locally sourced ingredients which have then been lovingly prepared, often by a household's ruling matriarch, to create not just a delicious meal, but a special moment in time. Those moments that people look back upon from youth and smile. Tony was, as shown by his voracious appetites, both gastronomic and, once upon a time, illicit, 
a man who sought extremes of emotion and experience because ultimately, they can make us feel more in touch with ourselves. Sometimes, food can be an escape, but it can also be a way of reconnecting to who you are. Overindulge in a gross of chicken nuggets while guzzling down a big bottle of your favorite sugar-charged soda, and you're running away from your problems. But during a dark time in your life, having a bit of comfort food the way mom used to make, that could be like coming home. I think for Tony, food was the ultimate human experience. One of the few things in life that you can see, hear, smell, touch, and taste. Unless you're out there licking the Mona Lisa, good food and drink is the experience that can trigger all your senses and give you a truly transcendent moment. What made Anthony Bourdain and his shows compelling to me was his fundamental humanity. He was a champion of the underclass and their culinary traditions. He understood that the fundaments of gourmet cuisine were pioneered from the peasant class to turn whatever was locally available, the herbs growing in the garden, the slightly wilted lettuce or cheaper cuts of meat, into something magical for the family. And as people sat around the table eating such humble but delectable fare, they would bond over shared experience. He always seemed happiest when he was sharing that meal with good company. And that's ultimately the heart of Tony. He may have been a rebel rock star, but he seemed to genuinely enjoy sharing a meal with people and hearing their stories and wisdom. I think that deep down, Tony saw the power of a good meal. It was a great unifier, and that food could break down the arbitrary societal constructs and barriers which divide us as a singular human race. We are all bound in our love of good food. It can build the strongest of bonds and heal the deepest of wounds. To Tony, I think if there was a hope for peace among men, it would be achieved through, or at least done over, a good meal and a strong glass of the local spirit. It's what makes us all human. Anthony Bourdain was a complex individual. He clearly believed that to have such a variety of good food in the world means that the world can't be all bad. In fact, the people that make such delicious home-cooked meals likely have a deep well of goodness as they seek to provide something which nurtures both body and soul. Tony's core goodness resulted in his outspoken activism, but also showed itself in smaller, but no less meaningful ways. During the critically acclaimed and now legendary 2006 episode of No Reservations, Tony and his team were filming in Beirut when fighting between Hezbollah and Israel broke out. Caught in the middle of the conflict with no clear evacuation plan, Tony responded by whipping up a hearty and home-cooked meal for his staff. Part of it is that, in crisis, we often fall back into old habits for comfort. For Tony, the professional chef of decades, that was prepping and cooking food. But there's also the part that Tony, during a time of stress, thought to provide something for his friends and crew. He couldn't stop the violence. He couldn't protect them from the artillery fire. But he could offer a small bit of comfort to people who were unsure of whether or not the next explosion was the one that would hit their hotel. His first instinct was to provide for others in their time of need. But Tony also had a deeply dark side which helped him fight against cynical attempts to compromise his vision. I think this is evidenced by the fact that no matter the title of the series or the station it was on, Anthony Bourdain's shows were always pretty much the same. This leads me to believe that was the form, style, tone, and voice with which he sought to imbue his series. His darker aspects is part of what made Tony so captivating. He was never without a quip, noting how off the rails the situation was becoming. He didn't shy away from voicing his displeasure or straight up making fun of things he found ridiculous. Those moments are hilarious. But it also meant that Tony saw and was willing to see through the rose-colored facades that some of his guys would try to use to make ordinary life in their native lands more appealing. He, therefore, could share with us some of the harsher truths about the places he visited. He didn't shy away from discussing poverty, conflict, or strife, and that willingness to show us both the beauty and darkness of the world provided eye-opening contrast to viewers. But it also made those moments where Tony enjoyed a simple home-cooked meal so much more magical. Those times when he would visit a family which is struggling to put food on the table and yet still offers the guest the lion's share of the meal cooked with well-owned skill and a deep love of their family, culture, and customs. Of course, 
I am under no illusion that any of the families who welcome us into their homes for a humble meal weren't well compensated for their generosity. But that's what Tony was able to do through all his works. He was able to give us a look at the harsh, absurd, quirky, and often beautiful reality behind things we take for granted. And just like those local home cooks we adored, he seamlessly wove all these ingredients into something special. I've discussed several times in previous videos the blank protagonist paradigm, how a kind of generic main character is easier for us to overlay ourselves and therefore vicariously live through their trials and tribulations. I think a lot of the culinary and travel shows are like that. They're a mechanism to feel as though we are the ones traveling, which is fine. It's a proven effective strategy and there'll be no shortage of shows which provide that. But that's also why travel shows come and go without making much impact. They give you a temporary rush and a feeling of satisfaction. They're meant to be relatively easily made and ingested while being as inoffensive as possible. But in Anthony Bourdain's show, we may have wanted to be him, but try as we might, Tony's bold and unique personality could not allow us to succeed at such a violation. As I wrote this script, I tried to inject phrases and verbal mannerisms that I think Tony would say, but his spirit bucks me like a bull and now he's coming to gore me. Where's my safety barrel? Someone send in the clowns. Help. How dare we even imagine ourselves as the great Anthony Bourdain and shame on any viewer to try. Tony in his show wasn't our avatar. We wouldn't experience travel as him. We would experience the delights and misadventures with him. We were his traveling companions. His narrations, his diatribes, quips. Those were all for us, baby. We had the privilege of traveling with the rock star of cuisine, and he was gonna show us a crazy good time. And he always did. Tony's raw intellect, culinary curiosity, vision for his show, and fundamental humanity was then tied up nicely by his layman's poetic prose, which was both raw and undeniably compelling. When Tony spoke, people listened. He had a magical way with words, which wasn't afraid to make copious use of crass language because that language itself brings its own power and imagery. Tony made us think and feel, which I think his legacy will show he achieved with gusto. Now, the part I know most people hate from these kind of video essays, the personal discussion, which is why I didn't put it at the beginning of the video as is standard. Anthony Bourdain has meant so much to me. I think we can all look back over our lives and recall the handful of people who have affected us deeply. Parents, teachers, friends, yes, even celebrities. Anthony Bourdain was one of those people for me, despite how he might scoff at my being a celebrity worshipping rube. I've been working on this script for about a week and a half, and I still can't come up with any better way to articulate what Tony has meant to me than I did when I found out he had died. After a few drinks to help me process the news, I could only sum it up as, about 12 years ago, I first watched a show hosted by this irreverent, straight-shooting New York chef with a passion for good food and drink, good company, and above all else, a belief that this world is too beautiful and her people too wonderful to not be explored. Aaron and I would spend hours watching him show how a culture is encapsulated by cuisine, but he always had a way of showing that Despite the infinite variation of skin color, belief, or choice of spices, there was a fundamental goodness within the human spirit. The fact that humans all over the world have the custom of a warm hearth and a hot meal for family and guest alike shows this. He was the beginning of a less than conventional life for Aaron and I. I'm not sure I can fully quantify the impact he has always had on me as a role model. Aside from that, I would not be who I am today without him. He taught me that it's okay to be in awe of the majesty of the world. He taught me that it's okay to get drunk and make a fool of yourself if you're with the people you love. He taught me that life is beautiful. During my deeper bouts of darkness, his show and his philosophy were always there to help me find my way back. So, to one of my true heroes, I hope you have a couple of good drinks, a home-cooked meal, and some good company wherever you are. If you get any time with the big man upstairs, make sure you RSVP me a spot at the table when my time arrives. Rest in peace, Anthony Bourdain. P.S. 
Thanks for the sushi recommendation in Osaka. They serve up a mean sushi. 